Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. The topic for discussion tonight is to focus in on some alternative pricing techniques that monopolies can use. And, you know, I said to you, if you thought about the four models that economists have of differing degrees of competition, we had the most competitive case, that was perfect competition. That's when, remember the four assumptions, products were identical, zero information cost, uh, lots and lots of buyers and sellers, and uh, no cost of entry or exit. And when that was the case, the firm had no market power whatsoever because price was equal to marginal revenue. Remember, you could sell every unit and get the same price because you're such a small part of the, uh, of the marketplace. And demand is horizontal, and therefore, price is the same as marginal revenue. As I think we talked about last week, uh, um, and I did the monopoly last week, right? The, the introductory monopoly, yeah. And I said to you, all the other, all the other models, that is, monopolistic competition and oligopoly and monopoly, all have downward, downward sloping demand curves. So I like to call this a discussion of price searchers, because people who are in an oligopoly or people who are in uh, monopolistic competition can employ some of these same techniques. You don't want to think that this has to be a monopoly in order to, uh, uh, to look at these. So we derived marginal revenue from a straight line demand curve. We said it, it intersects the uh, axis in the center, at the middle of it. And the first half, which is the upper half of the prices, is the elastic region. The midpoint is unitary elastic. That's when the percentages are the same, right? It's equal to one. And then, if you continue to lower price down below that, that point, uh, marginal revenue is actually negative. Uh, I mean, you'd, you'd be selling additional units, but you'd be losing so much on the previous units that the additional revenue would, in fact, uh, be negative. We then compared marginal revenue with marginal cost. That's just mathematics. Profit is total revenue minus total cost. So if something adds more to revenue than it adds to cost, then it contributes towards profitability. We don't know if it's profitable or not because it depends on fixed cost, but but it contributes toward. Leanne? Uh, what if, sorry, I should check the full marginal revenue and profit? Well, just yeah, but think about it as two distinct data sets. We yes. estimated the demand facing the firm. And, and by the way, be sure you understand this is the demand facing the individual firm, not market demand. And then we calculated marginal revenue as we did last time, right? And we lowered the price and saw how much total revenue went up. And that was marginal revenue. So those blue lines represent the data that's out there um, uh, about how buyers are behaving and, and, and a, a calculation from that about marginal revenue. Marginal cost, remember, is totally independent. That comes from the back room. Uh, and that's based on uh, the technology of production, the price of inputs, the value of alternative outputs, and those kinds of things. So we're able to overlay them because they are both price-quantity relationships or, or dollar amount uh, uh, relationships. The height of marginal cost is the additional cost of each unit being produced. The height of marginal revenue is when I lower the price to sell that unit, that's the additional revenue I'm taking in. And so we noted that the best you could possibly do is produce all these units where the marginal cost is less than the additional revenue. But once you get to this point, you don't want to produce additional units beyond that because you can see they add more to cost than they add to, uh, to revenue. So the solution for the monopoly pricing was to produce the quantity where the additional revenue just matches the additional cost and obviously, you'd be charging the price up on the demand curve because that's the price at which they're willing to buy that quantity, and that's the quantity that maximizes uh, uh, the possible profits. We noted that in this case, price is above marginal cost. Uh, and in the competitive case, price was equal to marginal cost because it was the same as uh, marginal revenue. Uh, and so what firms would like to do is in fact, let me go back to, yeah, uh, no. so the firm's going to take in P times Q as total revenue. 
price per unit is the same for each unit, uh, and that's the quantity distance is the amount I would want to produce. So total revenue is, in fact, uh, PM times uh, QM. Uh, but we notice that there's some people who are only paying PM who would be willing to pay more than that. Uh, and, and that area we called consumer surplus value, surplus value. It's the benefit I get above the price that I pay. It's, it's how much I value having it, meaning the most I'd be willing to pay, minus what I actually paid is consumer surplus uh, value. So firms would like to find a way to capture that if they possibly could. Also, they're only producing QM, and uh, this area of the demand curve indicated by B, uh, those people are willing to pay more than the marginal cost of production. And so if I could charge different prices for different units sold, then perhaps I could approximate capturing this additional uh, benefit of consumer surplus and then the additional uh, uh, revenue associated with, uh, uh, with the uh, second area. So the term price discrimination means basically charging different prices for different units sold. Uh, it could be different units to the same person. Uh, it could be different units to different people. But price discrimination is the process of charging prices uh, that are different if the customers have the same cost basis, uh, uh, the same cost basis of production. Um, it's kind of an interesting point as time has gone on. Years ago, the word discriminate was a compliment uh, because discriminate means to choose. And so if you said someone's a very discriminating person, it basically meant that they choose very carefully, right? That they really consider everything in, in making that particular choice. What has happened is it's been hijacked by the, the use of it to describe not, uh, not being willing to deal with minority groups in the population. But it's, that's not what discrimination means. It just means different prices, in this case, for different uh, buyers. If I could do that, it allows me to produce uh, additional uh, uh, units and, and potentially capture uh, consumer surplus. So there are three kinds of price discrimination, three different types of price discrimination. We'll call them first, second, and third degree is the name of them. And first degree is a pricing policy where I, I try and estimate the marginal value of each buyer. And then I try, I try and charge a price that's just equal to that person's marginal value. Uh, so different prices to different individuals based on my estimation of how much they're willing to spend, how, what is their marginal value, sometimes called their reservation, uh, reservation price. And there are different market structures that, that lead to this kind of, of an outcome. Um, I haven't told the auction story, right? Okay. When I was in the Air Force, when I was first in the Air Force, I was stationed at a, a, at a B-52 base up in Michigan, a little tiny town, Oscoda, Michigan, on Lake Huron. And there were like 2,500 people. It was a little tiny farming town, and there were like 4,000, 3,000 people on the base. And we were at the officers club one Friday night uh, for several hours, and, and that's a very important part of the story. So remember, keep that in mind. We were there for several hours in the bar, and... Um, and somebody came in and said, there's an auction downtown. And, and we said, well, that's, that's great. Let's go down to this, to this farmer's uh, auction. So three of us drove down and, and, and went in. And it literally was in a barn. And they had set up folding chairs. And they had the haystacks were the stage of, of where they were calling stuff out. And, um, and they were bringing out items. So I started putting my hand up. And the guy said, no, sir, you need to, uh, you need to get a paddle in the back with your number on it. And all right, all right fine. So I got a paddle and so forth. And, uh, and they brought out a pair of really nice lamps, uh, ceramic lamps. Uh, uh, and, uh, and one of my friends was getting married. And I thought, well, that, that would make a nice wedding present for him. You know, they, you know, they go on both sides of the sofa and stuff. So, uh, and, and this was many years ago. So the price opened up at like $4 for the pair. Uh, and I held up my thing. And, and then and, and and then and then it went to five and, and somebody else bid six and I bid seven and and I could pretty well see who I was bidding against. There were only four other people who were interested in the lamps. And it got up to like <coughs> excuse me, twelve fifty. 
And all of a sudden, the, the auctioneer pointed to the back of the room, and he said, it, it got to, to $12. He said, do I have 13 And he said, I have 13 in the back. So I turned around, and th there's a woman sitting in the very last row who has her paddle up. And it's like, what are you doing? She hadn't bid at all before that. You all with me? All these people had bid. Everybody else had just about dropped out, and now she's going to start bidding? And it's besides, look, you're a farmer's wife, and I'm an officer in the Air Force. I'm going to outbid you. I'm going to get the lamps. As I said, I had been in the officer's club for several hours. So now I'm going to win, right? Now it's a matter of winning, right? 13, 14, 15, 16, 28, sold to the gentleman up here. Ah, yes, see, I got the lamps. You didn't get them, and, and so forth. $28. Um, I don't know how high I would have gone simply to beat her, but but I was going to get the lamps uh, for sure. Uh, and so so that was fine. And then 15 minutes later, what item came up for bid? Another pair of identical lamps. They went for $13. 15 minutes later, what came up? A third pair of identical lamps. They went for $8. The fifth set went for like $4, uh, something like that. But you'll notice what happens in that process, and that is that the person who values it the most gets the first one. Now, I don't have to pay my marginal value. I do have to pay the marginal value of the next highest bidder who just dropped out. And then it, it, it moves across the crowd and moves down and gets that from each of the people who end up uh, buying it. So it is a technique, a market technique, that approximates this, uh, this idea of first-degree uh, competition. College scholarships are an interesting uh, phenomenon. Suppose that, suppose this college is trying to maximize profit, which is not what they maximize, uh, but they certainly like to make a profit and contribute towards research and higher salaries and stuff. So here I've just made it simplified. I've drawn a marginal cost that's constant. And, uh, and this is the demand of the students who are applying to this particular uh, school. And, and you can see that, that all these different people have different values that they place on being able to come to USC. Uh, and, uh, and so they're, they're interested in, uh, uh, in, in, in coming. Uh, and, and the height of the curve shows how much they'd be willing to pay uh, for each person. So if I charge P1, I only get Q1 in terms of, of students and, and on down uh, the line. Uh, and so how would I decide where to, uh, uh, where to charge the price? Well, as I said, if, if I wanted to maximize profit, I'd calculate marginal revenue from the demand curve. And I set my tuition at that rate such that that number of people are the people who are willing uh, to buy it. And at USC, it is now $55,000. Uh, and, uh, and so that's the tuition. But I know there are other people, and, and my marginal cost is only 10000 per student. Uh, uh, and, and, and I know there are people willing to pay something above 10000 uh, But let me ask you, what... What information could you seek if you were the college? What information could you seek that you think would be correlated with these different marginal values? What information from the families could you get that would tell you an, an, an estimate of perhaps how much they'd be willing to pay? Their income. Their income, right. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, and so what these, what the, what the schools do is say to you, we do have a big scholarship program, and USC does have a very large program, particularly for international students. Um, so send us your, your, your tax information, income information, uh, and, then, and then we'll see uh, uh, how we go uh, from there. Well, as you said, if, if the reservation price is what I'm willing and able to pay, then people with higher incomes will tend to be able to pay more uh, in that particular way. It's also the case that people of higher income value having a college education for their kids more. Uh, uh, most of them are probably uh, college graduates uh, in that particular way. So I set my tuition at 55000 and here's a guy who's willing to pay 50000 So I send the student a letter, and it says, congratulations, you've just won a scholarship for $5,000 to attend USC. Listen to the letter. 
they say, congratulations, you've been accepted and, and you won a $5,000 scholarship. How do you feel? You feel great, right? I won $5,000. Can you spend it at Stanford? No, it has to be uh, 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 there. So what they're actually doing is lowering the tuition by $5,000. Uh, and, and they're doing it in order to collect whatever they can from that uh, particular family, if this was purely the motivation of the college. Here's a guy willing to pay uh, forty-five, dollars uh, so I give them a, a $10,000 scholarship. Uh, and I match the scholarship amount so that what they're willing to pay plus tuition matches the uh, uh, plus scholarship uh, matches the uh, the tuition. It's really interesting in the letters because you know they say at the beginning you've won this and, and congratulations and this kind of stuff, and then at the bottom it says, um, in order to make this simple for you, uh, uh, we'll just apply the scholarship against the tuition, and so they'll show at the bottom tuition's fifty five minus the ten thousand dollars, so the balance that you owe is forty five thousand. Well, what they've basically done is lowered the price. Y'all with me? What they've basically done is lowered the price uh, in order to get those additional people uh, in uh, into the marketplace. So that's an example of first degree uh, price discrimination in that range after the, the set tuition uh, for the first group. So auctions, collar scholarships, and then there's a series of examples that I want to go through that demonstrate how firms can engage in this, uh, in this process. IBM was the first company to provide computer services to businesses. And the computers were like a 10 by 10 area. And it had to be raised up off the floor so that you could get the wiring underneath it. And then it had to be air conditioned because this was when you were using vacuum tubes, which generate a lot of heat. So you had, a, had to have a special air conditioning unit uh, uh, on that. And, uh, and they were leasing them to businesses. You couldn't buy it, but you could lease it. And they would, pro they would provide the maintenance on the machine uh, uh, as part of that uh, lease price. But they realized that for some businesses, this machine's going to be really valuable. I mean, it's going to solve problems that they could never have even approached uh, solving. And then for other people, they're willing to pay the lease price and, and maybe a little more than that. But, but there's big differences in how much these different firms value this uh, product. So these computers use punch cards for the data entry and for the programs. And I did this when I was at UCLA. A punch card is like 70, uh, 70, uh, 40 rows and 70 columns across, and it has all the letters and numbers, and then it has, you know, plus minus and signs and stuff like that. So you entered the data onto the punch card on a different machine. It was like a typewriter, uh, and you basically typed in your stuff, uh, and then you typed in your data, uh, and, uh, and it would punch out, you know, the same information on the cards. The reason is you wanted to find a way to rapidly get the data and the instructions into the computer and not have it run while you're sitting there typing and, and stuff like that. So they came up with this idea. And punch cards had been used in a couple of other uh, appliances at that time. Uh, so, so IBM thought about it, and they said, you know, one of the things that might indicate the difference values are the people who use more punch cards are either doing bigger data sets or they're doing more complex programs that have more instruction cards uh, at the beginning. Uh, and so what they did is they said to the customers, here's the lease price, but we're requiring you to buy the punch cards from us. And they charge one quarter of a cent per punch card. Well, you could get punch card for a tenth of a cent at that time. And so there was a big upcharge on the, on the punch cards. The, the way they were able to do it is to say to you that these are higher quality cards, which they were, they were thicker, and because we're responsible for maintenance, we're insisting that you use the better cards so it doesn't gum up the whole system. If you all remember Al Gore and the, re, and the, and the recount in Florida was, was counting punch cards uh, and, uh, and the ballots and looking for what are called hanging chads, which are little pieces of paper that didn't get punched all the way out and were still attached to the card. Um, so, so that's the way IBM set up the pricing. The lease price was the same to all customers. It has to be by law. But then the number of cards was the way to measure 
who was getting more value from it, and it was a way to collect the extra money. So if your firm uses like 6,000 cards a month, right, you're buying 6,000 cards from me, and if you're only using 1,000 cards a month, then, then so you end up paying more than he does. Everybody with me? The more intensive user pays more, and the mechanism was to charge for the cards, and that was the way to estimate value and also the way to collect it. Yeah. But, uh, how many machines leased to the company that you have to collect? What? How many machines leased to the company? I don't know. Uh, you had to pay for the no, it was a standard standard lease price for the from the machine. Right. If you have two machines, you have the same lease price for each right. machine. Good. Polaroid came out with a camera that actually developed the film on the spot. Now, to you, that's not at all interesting because we all have electronic cameras now, and, and, and even your phone is a camera uh, and so forth. But at that time, uh, if, you, if you were taking pictures, you were using film, and you'd take the pictures and then send the film off, probably to Kodak, who was the major processor, and you'd get the prints back in two weeks. Uh, and, and so you took it, and maybe you're on holiday, and then you got back and sent it to them. And then two weeks later, you'd see the pictures, and you'd realize that you'd cut off your fiancé's head when you took a picture of the Eiffel Tower, but I'm not there anymore, so I can't do anything about it. Polaroid came out with a camera and film that developed on the spot, that developed on the spot. And uh, and it was a little. It was like a cartridge, and so when when it was when it was pushed out of the uh, a camera, it went through rollers, and that released the chemical agents which which developed the film in the little uh, envelope. And then when it was done, you could peel it off, and you had the print uh, uh, in your hand. So much like the IBM case, Polaroid realized that some people who take a lot of pictures with this camera are going to get a lot of value from it. And some people don't use very many pictures, but so they don't get as much value out of it. So like IBM, the camera sold close to marginal cost, and then the upcharge was on the film. And the upcharge was substantial. It, like a, a package of six, a package of six uh, um, pictures sold for like $16. I mean, it was really, really expensive uh, in that way. So they really were collecting a lot on each of those uh, cartridges. Now think about how, think about what people, think about for what people would it be very important to be able to see the results of the picture immediately amongst all, all the people that use it? Tourists? Well, yeah, tourists to some extent, particularly if you're there and, and you want to get good pictures and you're not coming back, right, because you're there for a short period of time. So international tourists uh, would be one. But think about domestically. Yeah, Carol? Seeking grimoire? Well, that's good, uh, uh, to document uh, what, what's taking place. And, and, the, and the next part of that is insurance adjusters because they have to document the damage done to the car. And so, uh, so they would come out, they'd have a camera, and they'd be taking pictures all day as they go to different cars, take pictures of the damage, send it in so that the insurer knows what, it, what we have to fix uh, on the card. Uh, and then the other were professional photographers. And the reason is that um, they use a really big box camera, as you all know. And the sheet of film is, is literally, you know, like this. I mean, it's a big sheet of very expensive film. So by having a Polaroid, I can line up my shot, I can take a Polaroid, and then I can see the image of what I want to capture, and I can see the composition of the image. So I realize, okay, I have to move that vase because it looks like it's sitting on your head, right? So that's really a valuable use uh, uh, of them. And again, the person who uses the camera more intensively is the more has a higher marginal value for the camera, and you're picking it up in the same way. The upcharge is on the film. Sell, a, sell the camera close to marginal cost, and then put the upcharge on the variable, uh, the variable input. Xerox did the same thing with business copiers, uh, and that was that uh, um, they leased you the copier, but you had to buy the toner from them, and and the uh, and the toner was expensive, and. Um, you could use your own paper, but you had to buy the toner from them. It was like a black powder. In order to prevent someone else from competing of selling that black powder, 
the the joint between the cartridge and the machine has to be patented. So the the mechanism that you know as you attach the cartridge, the part where you attach it has to be patented. So you can't go out and make cartridges with the same thing and then sell uh, against me. And they did uh, that. Some really clever guys. Uh, went to these big businesses who used a, a lot of copies and they said, listen, we'll buy your empty cartridge for $5 each. And, uh, and, and it was just a piece of trash as, you're, as far as you're concerned, right? If it was empty, you didn't, you didn't just big, big plastic container. But they bought the actual containers uh, and then they filled them with toner and, and then they sealed them and then they sold them back to businesses at two-thirds of what IBM was charging and uh, uh, what Xerox was charging and made, made a lot of money uh, uh, doing it. Then they were sued, but they, uh, Xerox didn't win. The item that you see all the time is inkjet printers, uh, and, uh, and, and they're pretty complex electronic devices, particularly the color printers, combination printer scanner, uh, 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 all that kind of stuff. I bought a camera one Christmas at, at retail and ever since then, I've always bought online. But I bought it from Hooper Camera, and it was a Canon. And uh, and they said, well, if you buy the camera, you get this coupon uh, for a hundred dollars off the printer. And the printer was like a hundred and ten dollars. So you basically were getting the printer free uh, if you bought the camera. Uh, so again, you want to sell the item as close as you can to marginal cost of production, and then the upcharge is where. Yeah, the cartridges, right? And you guys know how expensive they are. It's like $30 for a black cartridge, right? Uh, and they're all locked up at, at Office Depot. The university buys my cartridges, but I was, I was doing something on a weekend, and I'd run out of black, and I just want, I had to finish the project. So I went to Office Depot and, um, and found the area, and they didn't sell the standard size cartridge in black. They only sold the really big cartridge, like the double cartridge. And the reason is they know you're the inelastic demander because you have to get it, right? You have to buy the black today, or at least I did, and some, some subset of the customers would. Uh, uh, so that was a, another way. But again, the person who uses it to print a lot uses more cartridges. They have a higher value. You pick it up by the upcharge on the, uh, on the cartridges. You can begin to see this... the, the the similarity of all of these uh, all these approaches. Uh, Gillette used to give away razor handles and then the upcharge is on the blade. Uh, and the upcharge is still on the blades, as you know. If you go in the drugstore, they're all locked up in a, in a glass case. Uh, and they sell for like, I don't know, $23 for six or something like that. Huh? Because they're expensive and they're easy to steal. Right. But they're expensive because the person who shaves more gets more value out of the handle, and they pay a higher price. Uh, Swiffer came out with these, these things, these cleaning pads, and they, they sell the little stick at, at, at marginal cost, and then the upcharge is on the refills uh, for it. And the, and, the, and the highest upcharge is on the refills that are wetted, that have some, some, some solution on them. Uh, uh. One of my favorites is Johnson & Johnson with Glade plugins uh, and the refills. Years ago, if you were going for dinner at somebody's house and you walked in and you smelled fish, it was like, oh, we're having fish for dinner, right? I like fish, right? Well, somehow, <coughs> Johnson & Johnson convinced all these people that your houses stink. And so you need a device to, to, to clean up the air. And, and now, What's the one where they, uh, Febreze is another example, right, where they spray clean it and they, and they show horrible pictures of how it smells to other people and, uh, and things like that. So again, the, the plug-in itself is relatively inexpensive. And now they have a whole bunch of different ones. They have one that has two different tones uh, uh, um, and, and then one that comes every once an hour. And then there's one that only squirts it out. It's, it's a motion sensor, so it only squirts it out when you walk by. Which, which I find rather offensive, right? Uh, uh, you know, you walk by, oh, geez, we need to have, uh, we need to have that fixed. Good. Can you think of some other examples of products where you buy a fixed element and then, and then the upcharge is on the, the variable cost? Carol? You mentioned Canon. Uh, 
Um, I know I'm from a political correct and all I'm stem stem, but in general in Connecticut, black and white, you know, or black I should say in color, eight in my assignment. Um, they always have a pack of film, I mean excuse me, photo paper. Of what? Photo paper. Yeah. Oh, they wrap they the you, cartridges with the paper. They give you photo paper included in the packaging for two and eight cards. And I've got so many <laughs> photo papers, you know, that not, I don't use. Yeah, send me, send me an email because I, I, I have to think about that one a little more. Behind you. Yeah. Uh, Carson? 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 Like the Febreze, I mean, like the Glade. Yeah, And then you refill it. Yeah. 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 No, because you can buy from other companies. It's got to be a case where where they can make you buy from them, and then they can collect the higher price. Yeah. Cameras. Oh, 4K video. Right, right. But it's not a variable. I mean, you're only going to buy one lens, right? I mean, so it, it, it's, it's, it's selling you a higher quality. That's true. But it's not that repetitive idea of collecting that from the more intensive user, right? Yeah. Well, then don't say it. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, you can tell me after class. Yeah. No, well, the, the computer games that sell you things within the game is a great example. And, and my son got me started, and I've spent a lot of money <laughs> on gems. It's Clash of Clans, and then it's Clash Royale, uh, Boom Beach, uh, and, and, and for those of you who haven't played it, it, it's free. The game is free, right? You download it for free. And then you, you build buildings, and then you train people to fight, and then you have battles and stuff. And you can raise the level of the people of their skills uh, uh, by, by spending gold. and Or, or um, what's the liquid? The Nixon. Uh, elixir, right? But the way they've set it up is, if you if you go to train this guy, it, it takes 14 days for him to get trained. Well, you want him to be half, You want him to do it when? No. Right now. So you can go online and buy these gems, and they have, and that's all priced too, right? Like the lowest price is if you pay a hundred dollars, you get 1,400 gems, and then the smaller amounts <coughs> moving down. But um, but it's been extremely successful. In fact, that company, which was Swedish, was sold to a, a Japanese or a Chinese consortium for like $2 billion. They generate millions of revenue per day uh, uh, from those people like me. Uh, uh, yeah. No, yeah. What about a remote control? So you got to buy batteries? No, but you can, you can buy the batteries from somebody else. It has to be a lock in. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. In the back. Uh, the Nespresso machine? The Nespresso oh, machine? Yeah, Nespresso. Oh, perfect. The K-cup machines. Yeah, to carry. Except you can buy, no, but again, see, you can buy those from, from the coffee makers. No, but you only can buy the capsules from the Nespresso itself. They have the machine. They need to be specific. Well, the K-Cups don't. They're the standard, and all the machines take them. But the new Keurig, Keurig does require that you buy it from them. And they're claiming that the cartridge has instructions on the top that the machine reads and then makes it hotter or colder or whatever. But that's a good one. Send me an email in the back. What about Apple TV? Would you buy this? Tell me more. What? Yeah, but you can, again, buy music now from so many sites besides iTunes. Uh, probably initially it, it had some element of that, right? Yeah, that's right. 
Yeah. What about the iPhone 7? Because you have to buy the little thing. No, it's got to be something that's got a repetitive thing. So the more intensive unit, unit, the more intensive user buys this repetitive product. But you brought up a really interesting point, and that is, and you know, Apple prices all of their accessories, and you can only buy them from Apple, I think, right? And they're expensive. So you buy the camera, but then you have to buy memory, right? And there's 16, 32, and 64. And then if you want uh, like a microphone or and all that kind of stuff is, is. so that's, that has elements uh, uh, of it, but it's not the repetitive uh, thing. Carol. Do you have to buy them in the game? Yes. Yeah, it's the same thing as, as the other one. Yeah, yeah. If you have if you have to buy it in the game, then you're buying it from the manufacturer, and then it is first degree price discrimination. Yeah. Uh, how about the GoPro camera? The what? GoPro. GoPro. GoPro camera. What is that? GoPro. No, I heard him. I yeah. just don't know what it is. It's a small camera, and uh, you buy it and mix by it like the mounts, where you can put it on the bicycle. Well, that's like the Apple thing, where the accessories are yeah. there. No, I understand, but but it, but it's not. You, you want to get this idea that it's it's measuring the intensity of the user and then collecting from it is first degree, right? Now we'll get to two other kinds uh, uh, of price discrimination. Um, good, yeah. Yeah, that's good. No, that's good. Uh, and PlayStation 4, because you have to buy the, the programs from them, right? So you sell the Xbox close to cost, and then the upcharge is on the, on the individual games. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, so that's first degree. Everybody got it? That's first degree. Different prices to different buyers. You're trying to estimate marginal value and charge it. And, uh, and one method is this fixed cost plus variable. Uh, technique of collecting more uh, money. Second degree uh, is offering you and all and each buyer a schedule of prices for additional units purchased, uh, and uh, and it is lowering the price for buying additional units. So I start with one price for the first part, and then if you want to buy ten more, I lower the price on those, and then ten more, I lower the price on those. So you're trying to actually move down the individual's demand curve, right? I'm trying to get you to buy those units that you value less, but charge you high for the first units that you uh, value. Good example is uh, you'll see these ads for tires all the time. Uh, uh, buy three and get four and get the fourth tire free. Well, stop and think. When, what are the reasons for buying tires? Yeah, they're for the car. <laughs> and for bicycles, too. They have tires, too. Yeah. Like if you're going out and you're doing like traveling, you want to save these tires? Or if well, you, you, you said it in the last part. You buy it by the set, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you buy the tires, and they, they're good for 30000 or 35000 and then they all wear out, right? Or, or whatever it is. Good. What is the other reason to buy a tire? No. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, why else do you need a tire? When you blow, when you get a blowout, right? When you get a blowout, you need a, you need a tire, right? But you only need one or two. The reason you might want to get two is if any of the tread is very worn on the tire, for safety purposes, you want the same tread on both tires because otherwise when you hit the brakes, it will swerve. So if you have a blowout, it's either one or two tires. Good. Well, now stop and think. You get the price break only if you buy three. So the price break goes to people who are replacing the tires that are there on the car now. You all with me? Good. Do you have to do that right now? No. 
you, you see the tires, they're getting thinner. You put Abe Lincoln there and, and you see where it is on his head. And, and so, so you have plenty of time to shop. Most tire advertisements are on radio. Uh, and the reason is that, uh, um, at least historically, people listen to the radio a lot, AM radio in the car. And, uh, and you'd hear all these ads for, for tires. If you have good tires, you just tune the ad out, right? You just don't pay attention to it. It's just like background noise. But as you get closer to, to saying, I, I'm going to get new tires pretty soon, then you start listening to the ads, right? Uh, so you have plenty of time to get information about the substitutes, to get information about the alternatives available to you. Consequently, you are the elastic buyer. You all with me? You're the elastic buyer because you have lots of time to shop for substitutes and get information about them. If you have a blowout, when do you have to buy the tire? Right. Now, right? You can't drive very far on these donuts, the little tiny tires that are in the uh, trunk. I actually borrowed a car when I was poor <laughs> from the woman I was dating who was wealthy, but that's a different story. Um, but we were driving up to... Uh, to um, the Bay Area from, uh, to have Christmas at my brother's. And so the kids were with me and I was driving her car. And I noticed that the car was pulling to the right a little bit. It wasn't bad, you know, I mean, but I had to hold the wheel, right? Uh, and, and, and it was pulling. And so we got, we were going up to five and we got past Button Willow and we were in some strange part of it. And the, and the tire goes out. And I get out and look at it, and it has worn away the whole inside of the tire because it was misaligned, and I was driving, pulling it. It just wore all that off until it, until it blew. So I got a tow and I, from a gas station that was close by, and I had to, and I had to buy the tire from them because there's, there's nobody else around, and I paid like $250 for the tire. I'm the inelastic demander so they can jack up the price because they know you need a tire right now, right? So uh, so always, if, if your car is pulling, don't drive it a long ways. Uh, uh, that's probably the most valuable thing I taught you all semester. Um, if you go to the exchange or any place else, you'll see this kind of pricing on soft drinks. The medium is 16 ounces. It sells for $1.09. Uh, and if you divide that up, that comes out to about 0.68 uh, cents, uh, about 6.8 cents per uh, ounce. And then the large will be 10 cents more, uh, and it increases, in this case, uh, the amount by, by six ounces. And so each of those ounces only cost you about 1.6 cents, right? And then the extra large adds 10 ounces for the extra 10, and that brings the marginal cost down to one. So that's what they're doing. They're moving right down your demand curve. They're encouraging you to buy the additional units by lowering the price on those additional units that have less marginal value to you. There's an interesting observation, though, that if you go to 7-Eleven, you can buy a gulp, which, and I think it's actually even larger than this. It's, it's this giant tub of Coke or whatever the soft drink is. I mean, it really is. It's this giant uh, tub. And that, the price is not lower. It comes up a little bit. And the reason is that, that, that whoever buys that always buys the biggest size. You guys with me? There's some people who will always buy the biggest size possible, thinking that it's the best bargain. But in this case, uh, uh, the, the best bargain was, was uh, the extra large. Toothpaste in the, in, the, um, in the pharmacies, right, drugstores. The little tiny travel toothpaste, which has like two ounces in it, is like $4. And then for five fifty, you can get a regular size, which might have eight ounces in it. And then for another dollar, you can get a gigantic size, which has 16 ounces. That's the family pack, right? Individuals don't buy that because you'd have it around so long that the, you know, the tube would probably fall apart before you used it all up. But it's an example of the same thing. If you look in the coffee aisle, like the instant coffees, little tiny one, the travel one, very expensive. Oops. Um, and, and, and cereal's the same way, right? You have a standard size, you have a family pack. Family pack lowers the price on the additional uh, units. Instant coffee comes in a little tiny jar, regular size and a family size. And again, they're moving you down your demand curve uh, uh, in using that technique. Health clubs will often 
offer a second family member a, a membership for a price less than the original membership. The, 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 the reason is when one of the when one of the couple joins the gym, the other member of the couple may want to also be involved in it. Or the person who's joining says to their spouse, and you're going to go too, right? Uh, uh, and so they offer that as a, as a lower uh, price. The other thing health clubs do, which you all know, is they sell a year's membership, right? To get it, you have to sign up for a year. Uh, and the reason is that most people who sign up, and most of them sign up in January and February, New Year's resolutions, go for like a month and the, or two months, and then they don't go anymore. So they, they, that's why it's sold in bulk in that way uh, to capture them. So that's second degree. Yeah? Um, for the tires, if I free, I get them uh, for free. I think one of the companies, they let you like buy the free tires individually and the bulk, and then like after a year for free. You don't have to take the whole set, like buying up there. Oh, at, at, over time? Yeah, over time. Like buy one now. Yeah, good. Send me send me an email. The other one is is restaurants that have that uh, that card, right? That they punch, and so after you have ten, after you buy ten, then you get the next submarine uh, free. Um, it's an example of price discrimination, and it's actually type three, uh, third degree. But I'll I'll get to it. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Add, adding family members is a lower uh, a lower price. Good. So anyway, that's and and this is used. It's also called block pricing. You want to write that down. It's also called block pricing, uh, or, or because you're selling blocks at different uh, additional charges. The electric company does the opposite, and that is that during peak loads, uh, um, they'll sell you the first number of kilowatts at a price. But if you're using more than that, then the price goes up. And if you're using more than that, the price goes up. So it's blocking, but it's going upward. The reason is that um, they have to put on more expensive generation equipment, or they have to buy power from somebody else. Uh, uh, to meet that, that peak demand, right, when, when it's above the average level that they're, in fact, uh, providing. Um, one of the things they do is to, is to sell to business firms, and then they will say to the firm, I'll give you a lower rate, substantially lower rate, if you agree that when we hit the peak, if we hit the peak and when we do, you will shut down and not use electricity. So it's a way of, uh, uh, of getting a real price break the rest of the year, and then it's, it's like a gamble, right? Maybe they won't hit any peak periods, uh, uh, and you still get the lower rate. But it's a clever way of buying power. Uh, in other words, they're buying it from the customer who's, who's, not, who's not using it. And it's cheaper for them to do that, as I said, than go out in the peak market uh, time and buy. Good. Third degree is my favorite, uh, and that is... Charging different prices to different groups of people based on differing elasticities of demand or estimates of elasticity of demand. Different groups of buyers. If I can identify who are the really elastic buyers and who are the more inelastic buyers, and if I can adopt a pricing schedule that will do that, then I can increase my, uh, increase my, um, my income. Now stop and think about elasticity. What were the factors that caused someone to be more elastic as a buyer? What were, what were the conditions that generated uh, that? Okay, time is the second law of demand, right. And, and let me come back to it, but that's correct. The first is how much information you have about the price change and the substitutes. And, and if you don't even know the price has gone up, you're not going to change how much you buy. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so how much you know about the price change and how much you know about substitutes. The more you know, the more elastic you are as a buyer. The second was uh, percentage of income spent. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the second was the actual number of substitutes that are available uh, to you. More substitutes available, if you know about them, the more elastic demand is. 
The third was percentage of income spent. If something's a larger part of your budget, you tend to be more elastic. Or saying it the other way, if something's a small percent of your budget, you tend to be inelastic. Like chewing gum, you don't care, right? And I'll double the price, you'll still chew the same amount of gum. Of gum. So keep those in mind because those are the things that we're going to look for when we try to determine who are the elastic buyers and who are the inelastic buyers. And then again, remember your pricing. You lower the price to which group? Elastic or inelastic? Elastic, because that increases total revenue. You raise the price to the inelastic demanders, and that increases total revenue, right? Everybody with me? Good. So, so, so if you see somebody getting a lower price, the seller must believe that that's the elastic demander. And then you can use your knowledge of economics to say, well, why, why might that be the case? Which of those factors would tend uh, to be true? So the necessary steps are to identify who the subgroups of buyers are with different elasticities. You don't have to know the actual number. You just have to know this group is much more elastic than, uh, than this group. And then find a way to collect the higher price from the inelastic buyers and a lower price from the elastic buyers. And the third is prevent resale between the two. Uh, and you want to add that to your notes uh, uh, because it's not on the slide. Identify who the groups are, figure out who you want to raise the price to, who you want to lower it to, and then find a way to collect the higher price uh, and, 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 and lower the price to the other group so they don't cheat, so they don't pretend they're in that group to get the lower price uh, in that way. There are lots of examples uh, of this, but graphically you can see this is, the, this is the kind of idea. Suppose that's the market demand. And so if I just set my price like the monopoly price, I charge PM to all the buyers. But suppose I could identify these two groups of buyers. One group is elastic, is, is elastic, and one group is inelastic. So what do I want to do with this guy? Raise or lower the price? Elastic, you want to lower it. Good. And inelastic, you want to raise it. Good. So graphically, you can see what I'm doing. I raise the price to PB for the inelastic demanders. I lose a little bit of sales, but total revenue is higher. And, I, and, I, and I'm producing a few, I'm, I'm producing and selling a few fewer units. Lower the price to the elastic demander, and, uh, and I get this big increase in total revenue, and I get a big increase in quantity. So it's entirely possible that if you can do this successfully, you will have eliminated that efficiency problem we talked about with monopoly. Because you'll be able, if you can separate the groups out, to, to produce and sell those additional units. Good. Uh, and so this is the graphical uh, idea. Notice, by the way, that it, it's not necessary it's two groups. Uh, uh, it could be 10 different groups if you can figure out you know, the, the relative elasticities uh, of all of those. Necessary conditions, identify and separate the buyers by elasticity collect different prices from different buyers, and as I said, prevent, uh, prevent resale uh, between them. You don't want the elastic buyer who's buying it cheap to be able to sell it to the inelastic demander, and then you've, you, you've lost that, uh, that increased uh, revenue. The most standard example is, uh, is grocery coupons. Uh, the manufacturers, as you know, publish these coupons and, and you can get a substantially lower price. I've been at Ralph's watching the person in front of me, you know, the items. And there are only a few items left, right? She's bought a lot of stuff. And they're saying, oh, good, we're about to go. And then she hands the guy like a stack of these little tiny cutouts, right, uh, the coupons. And then he scans them all. And I've seen him get like a third off, right? Some of them are double the manufacturer's coupon. I mean, they, and they really are. Uh, 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 a substantial way of saving money. Okay, so so who's the elastic demander? The person who uses coupons or who doesn't? Who uses them, right? Good. And then the person who doesn't use them pays a higher price. So basically you raise the price on the shelf and then you lower the price to this other group. If that's the case, I must believe that the people using the coupons are the more elastic demanders because they're the ones I'm giving a lower price to. Well, if, stop and think about the steps necessary to get the lower price. Number one, you have to get the coupons. So you have to know where they are. Where are they? 
in the newspaper. And they also now have these mailers that they stuff your mailbox with, right? But And what day of the week is it? Sunday. Sunday. It used to be Thursday and Sunday. Now it's primarily on Sunday. And to get, and, and then the second step is you have to cut out the coupon. And you're dealing with newsprint, which has the worst ink in the world. It's, it gets all over your hands and so forth. You can't take the whole page in and go, yeah, I bought this item. And, and No, you have to cut it out, right? Then you have to remember to do what? Take it with you. Good. You have to buy what? The product specifically that's on the coupon. Uh, no, sir, you bought the orange-flavored Coke, and this is for the vanilla Coke, so you don't get uh, the lower price. You have to remember to do what when you're checking out? Give it, give it to the clerk, and you have to use it before it expires. Good. And that's in real big print? No, it's in little tiny print, right? I have failed to get the lower price for every one of those reasons. One is I never got the coupons. Two is I got them and forgot to take them to the store. Three is I bought the wrong item. Four is I was talking to another customer. I forgot to give them to the checker uh, uh, in that way. Um, so those are all the steps that are involved in getting the lower price. You have to go through all those particular steps. Well, it turns out that if you think about married professional families where it's just a husband and wife, those are called dinks. Dinks, D-I-N-K-S, double income, no kids, right? This will be on the final. Dinks, right? Double income, no kids. Professionals like that do not tend to use coupons, right? If this woman is a neurosurgeon, she doesn't spend her, her Sunday afternoons cutting out little tiny pieces of paper to save 60 cents on some margarine or uh, things like that. Uh, so those are the inelastic demanders who don't use it. Secondly, um, secondly, you have to carry them around, and, and they're only worth like 10 cents and 15 cents. So people who are, who are wealthy don't want to carry little slips of paper around uh, uh, in that uh, particular way. The people who use them the most are people who have large families, large families, lots of kids, good Catholic families, right? Six kids in the family, particularly teenagers, because they can go through food just like amazing amounts, right? And then they bring their friends in. They can empty their refrigerator in a, in a very short period of time. Also, and this we're talking about middle income now, uh, families. Often, historically, the wife did not work. And so her opportunity cost of time was a lot lower. And so she could take the time to, to do this and then and so forth. I've seen people that index them, right? They have a little folder that has the alphabetical uh, things. Uh, and... Uh, or they get the list ahead of time and, and, and have the coupons all together ready to hand to him uh, to get uh, the discount. Um, and the reason is, again, the expenditure on food is a smaller portion of the budget for the dinks than it is for the families with lots of kids. The percentage of their income they spend on food is much, much higher. And so those are the elastic demanders. So that's who I want to give uh, the lower price to. I am successful using only two coupons. One of them is that I do carry around a little tiny piece of paper. <laughs> I don't have any of them. <laughs> no, I do. It's, this is for my dry cleaner, uh, and it's 25% off. And dry cleaning is expensive. So, uh, so it's worth it to me to get 25% uh, off. The other one is Bed Bath & Beyond. Yes. Yeah, and, and you guys all know this. Number one, it's a big piece of cardboard, so it, it's not this little tiny thing. It comes in the mail, uh, and, and, uh, and you can cut it out. And there are two kinds. One is like $5 off an item that's over $20, and then the other one is 20% off any item. So it can be a substantial savings when you're buying something expen expensive. Two, they never expire. There's an expiration date on them, but they will take them no matter when you bring them in. You all with me? So, so you don't have to worry about meeting the expiration date. Three, you can use up to five coupons on any visit to the store. So you can basically get 20% off of five items uh, by doing that. So I, I do have those in the glove compartment in an envelope. And I, can, I can manage, if I remember to take them in, I can, I can do that. Uh, so very, very um, popular. Yes.
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really a good, really good price break. Airlines. Airlines charge totally different fares for the exact same seat. Uh, uh, how do you get the lower fare? You buy it when? In advance. Who are the two kinds of flyers? Business and, and families. Good. Or, or vacation or, or that kind of thing. The business buyers are more inelastic for a couple reasons. One is the company's paying for the flight, not the guy who's flying. The company's going to pay for it. So, so it's easier to say, yeah, I need to go to this meeting and so forth. Secondly, you don't know when you're going to have to go often until the day before the meeting, right? Like they'll call a meeting in two days in Chicago, and now you have to go at a specific time, and then you want to come back as quickly as possible. Good. So if you fly during the week, round trip, uh, and don't stay over a weekend, there's a certain rate that you get. Uh, and then if you stay over a weekend, it's a slightly lower rate. And the reason is that if you stay over a weekend, part of it might be business, but part of it may be enjoyment of being in that particular uh, location. Um, and if you're traveling on vacation, you can book it two or three months in advance. I mean, you, you can easily do that. You know I'm going to take a vacation in August. I don't have to take it in any particular week, right? So I've got some, some substitutes that are available uh, to me. Um, and now, as you know, there are all these, well, let me, let me do hotels and I'll come back. Um, so that's, so airlines definitely do uh, discriminate. Hotels have like 12 different rates. The major hotels have 12 different rates for their rooms. I was dating a woman who was a, who was a travel agent, and this is when I was consulting, so I was doing a lot of traveling, and, and she would book everything for me, but, but she was pointing out there are all these different things, and she knew what to talk to him about when she called up. There are convention rates. There are uh, rates for AAA members. There are rates for AARP their rates for uh, families. Uh, Marriott now has these things where if you stay so many nights, you get one night free in the next visit or some other uh, time. And then they have clubs where you, you accumulate points also in that way. So, uh, uh, so again, the guy who has to go on short notice pays the higher price. And if you can book it well in advance uh, or show flexibility, then you can get a lower price. If you're willing on the airline to chance that you're not going to get on the plane, meaning you're flying standby, you can get a lower price. But you don't know if you're going to get on or not, right? It'll depend uh, on it. One of, the, uh, one of my research assistants used to go down to the airport on Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and, and he would buy tickets on a whole bunch of different flights, which he was not going to take. And then when they get to the gate, they'd have, because they overbook those days. They overbook that day. They overbook Sunday, which is the time most people come back uh, on Sunday. In fact, Sunday's busier than Wednesday uh, in that way. But they'll buy back the, 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 the seat from people who are on there who are willing to give up the seat for either additional flights in the future or a free flight or money. So Dave would make money. He, he would go, and, and he, he didn't want to get on the plane, right? But he would sell his seat uh, to the high, you know, when he'd get the highest price he could uh, uh, for doing that. Movie theaters. Who gets the lowest price? Kids. Kids. Who gets the second lowest price? No. Old people. Old people. Then students. Who pays the full price? Adults, right, who work all, all the time, right? And then they even do it by time of day, right? The matinees are much cheaper. Well, who's going to go to the matinees? Not people who are, who are working. It's going to be seniors who are retired or somebody taking their kids uh, to go, right? Never go to a matinee. Don't ever go to a matinee. It's a horrible experience. <laughs> I did this at Lemley's, and, uh, and it was all these old people, and, and, they, and they, they can't hear each other, so they talk really loud. And, and then they're on their walkers and stuff. So you don't want to get messed with. Don't, don't do that. Yeah. Would you say that most of the time this works in, in like together with the second law of demand? For which? With the third degree. No, because the second 
the second law says that over time you have more information about substitutes, there are more substitutes, uh, and you have a chance to change the peripheral package of goods. So I'd have to have one of those elements, right, to, for it to be, <coughs> for it to apply in this case. But it certainly can be the case that, that as, you, as you go longer, you find out more. I book with Southwest. I fly up and down to San Francisco and Oakland frequently. And, uh, and I fly up on Southwest. And I was going up, I was going to stay over the weekend. And uh, so I'm on Southwest site and I book, I book the, the senior fare, which is still refundable. And um, it's a little higher than the flyaway fare, but you can get your money back if you cancel. <coughs> and then on the site, on the Southwest site, they said, would you like to book everything here, a package deal. And you can book the hotel through us, you can book the car rental through us, uh, and normally package deals are cheaper, right? So I said, yeah, I mean, I knew where I, knew where I was going to stay, and I did need a car, and so I reserved the car, and I was going to stay at the Marriott. And, uh, and I bought them on Tuesday to fly on Friday, and then something came up, and I couldn't go. Uh, and so... Uh, so I contacted Southwest, and they said, I want to cancel my flight. And they said, well, you have a non-refundable ticket. I said, no, I don't. I, I bought a senior ticket. He said, no, you bought a flyaway ticket. I'm getting pissed now, right? I know what I bought, right? Uh, well, what had happened is, when I said I wanted the package deal, they, they connect me to Orbitz. I think it was Orbitz. And Orbitz gets the rooms more cheaply, right? Because they, they buy them in blocks, but they can't, they can't get a refund on them. And the same is true for, um, for the flight. I couldn't get a refund because they had moved me from where I was, the senior rate, to the flyaway rate uh, uh, in doing that. So I was really pissed, right? In fact, I called the hotel and I said, I want to cancel. And, and I'd already tried to cancel the flight. And they said, well, the rooms have already been canceled. Okay, so if they've been canceled, then they didn't pay anything for them. And they wanted me to pay them the full amount that I had booked for it, right? So I got a hold of the, and, and this is who you want to contact if you have a problem with a company. Go online, find the company website, contact the vice president in charge of sales or in charge of customer service. Don't go through all those phone calls and stuff because those people, many of them, don't have the power to do anything. So I wrote to this guy on university letterhead. And I said to him, um, I just want you to know this is what happened to me on your site. You never told me I was going with Orbitz. You didn't tell me that I, it would now be non-refundable. Uh, and I teach about 1,000 students per semester at, at, at CSUN and at USC. And in my teaching, I often relate experiences that I've had uh, uh, in the marketplace, both good experiences and those that were not, that were not good. And I got a full refund from Southwest. I couldn't get the hotel back, but Southwest said, oh, no, that's fine, right? So use whatever power you have, right? Disneyland and other theme parks discount for local, uh, uh, local customers versus people who are coming in uh, from out of state. Uh, they do it by zip code. So you can show them your driver's license, and if you're in a certain zip code, you get, you get the lower fee. So the idea is lower the fee for the locals and keep the fee up for the people who are flying in. That must mean the locals are what kind of buyers? Elastic. elastic. And the other guys are inelastic. Good. What is it about the locals which would make them more elastic? Good. They know about the options, right? They know about the options. They know where Six Flags is. And what's the other one? Uh, the Jelly People. What, what is it? Knott's Berry Farms. Horrible place. Um, no, it was, it was New Year's Eve, and, and, and my date and I were going to go to Disneyland. So we drove down to Disneyland. We got there about 9 o'clock, 9.15, and the park is closed. And it's like, no, 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 it's New Year's Eve. You can't be closed. It was closed because they're full, right? Uh, and, and so if you want to go to Disneyland, you have to get there early, right, uh, on those nights. So we ended up at Knott's Berry Farm, and, and it was not... It was not a pleasant. Well, he still had a good time, but it wasn't. Good. That's an example again. Lower it to the elastic demanders, raise it to the inelastic demanders. The other thing theme parks realized was if you're coming in from out of town, 
What other products are you going to have to buy? What other products are you going to have to buy that the local guy doesn't have to buy? Food and, well, everybody gets souvenirs. Food and lodging. Good. And so you'll see most of them now have hotels. Disneyland has their own hotels around there. And they offer uh, uh, restaurants within the park uh, 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 for those people. And then you, know, you guys see this all the time. Subway does it. The car wash does it. You get something and they punch it or they stamp it. Uh, and the, pre the people who are willing to carry the card around get the lower price. You get the, the 13th one uh, free. If you, if you hardly ever go to Subway, you'll, you'll lose it before you use it, right? Uh, uh, or if you hardly ever go, I don't want my wallet full of all these cards that I don't even uh, uh, use. So again, it's usually the lower income or middle income, higher income people do not uh, take advantage uh, of them. Mail order catalogs, great example. Around Christmas time, th these companies mail out a lot of catalogs. And I bought a lot of stuff from catalogs and online. So I get like eight catalogs every day from places I've never bought from, but they're all part of a family of, 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 of companies and so forth. So Marge lives in Florida, and she has bought a lot of clothes from Eddie Bowers. Uh, uh, and, then, and then Karen lives in Kansas, Marge, Karen. Karen lives in Kansas, and she's never bought anything from Eddie Bowers. Uh, and they have the same catalog, right? It's the Christmas catalog with the snowman on the front. So they're on the phone talking about it, and, uh, and, and Marge says, yeah, I really like this pink sweater on page 57, but I'm not willing to spend, you know, $79 for it. And Karen says, it's, it's not 79 it's 59 And so Marge says, I'm looking at it in the catalog. It's 79 now, remember, Marge had bought a lot from Eddie Bauer before, and Karen had not bought from them before. It's price discrimination. And what they do is, I want to lower the price to Karen because she's bought clothes. She simply hasn't bought my clothes. Marge has already expressed by her past purchases that she has a preference for my products over the competition. So she's the more inelastic demander, so I raise the price to her. It's really counterintuitive because you would think, what? No, but you'd think, well, but no, that's what you're doing by this. You're lowering the price to the new person to bring them in as a customer. Good. You would think that they would give the break to somebody who's bought a lot from them, right? Like the family member, or, you know what I'm saying? They have family member stuff and so forth. But in this case, it, it's the opposite. It'll, it'll hit the news, uh, and, and, and Eddie Bauer did it one year. And, and then the companies always have to have some excuse. So it's like um, they were printed at different... Uh, places and 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 we had changed the price before we printed the second catalog uh, uh, and some other you know story about it but uh, uh, but it's price discrimination in that one at holiday times the mixers that you buy to mix with alcohol go on sale now if you go into Ralph's their standard is Schweppes is there and Schweppes is the most expensive and it's a dollar twenty nine for the bottle and you're talking about tonic for gin and tonics, you're talking about the mix for Bloody Marys, the mix for margaritas, you know, all these, these mixers. Normally, Vaughn's is like 89 cents, and then Canada Dry, uh, Canada Dry is like 99 cents, and then Schweppes is like $1.29. But around the holidays, they lower the price on Schweppes and Canada Dry to match the price that Vaughn's charges. So they must believe what is true about some holiday purchasers. If they're lowering the price, then they must think they're more elastic, right? At least a portion of these people are more elastic. How do the buyers differ at the holidays versus people who buy throughout the year? Yeah. Well, they may. They may. But why would they, why would they buy in bulk? They don't know what? They don't know how many people because they're having a party. Good. And that's the difference. Um, it's not that they don't know how many people are coming. It's, it's, that, it's that they know people are going to come. And they may not even, they don't drink this stuff themselves. I don't, they don't drink gin and tonics. They don't drink Bloody Marys. But they want to have the mixers there for the people who are coming. 
Uh, and, and so they know that normally Schweppes is much more expensive. But if Schweppes now is the same as Vaughn's, I can buy Schweppes and then I can impress my guests, right? No, oh wow, he's got he's got Schweppes uh, mixers. So it's a it's a clever way of, of doing it. Uh, I use Mr. and Mrs. T Bloody Mary mix, uh, uh, and I make my own margaritas. But um, so I cheat, and then the holidays come, and I buy like four bottles of it. And 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 the people who buy it every week, or or the people who buy it when it's not a holiday, are buying it for themselves. Uh, and so they tend to be the more inelastic demanders. So you want to raise the price uh, to them. Prescri prescription drugs sell for different prices in different countries. Highest price is the United States. Second highest is Canada. Then there comes Mexico is substantially cheaper. And then Africa is much, much cheaper. Why do they do that? Huh? Income. Right. In the United States, the incomes are the highest, and so the amount spent on prescriptions would be a smaller percentage of their income than in Canada, certainly than in Mexico, and definitely in, uh, in Africa. In their advertising campaigns, they will say to you, uh, well, we, we know that some people can't afford the medication, and so we're, we're willing to you know, try and help them because they need medication. No, it's price discrimination. They sell a lot more drugs when they, when they have a schedule of prices in that way. Uh, because they can collect uh, that amount. All, now, as you all know, almost all of them in the TV ad says, if you can't afford astrogenif, whatever it is, if you can't afford the medication, contact, you know, the, 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 the company and, and maybe we can work something out. So if you show them you have a low income, they will give you price breaks uh, uh, on it. Doctors charge different, p different fees for different medical services given at different locations. If you're a neurosurgeon and you're located in Beverly Hills, you set the monopoly price, but that, may, that monopoly price might mean you're only working three days a week, right? At that price, it's the best price to charge, but you're only working three days a week. So what these guys will do is get privileges at some place like Pacoima or West Hills or some other lower income area and then charge less at those locations than they do uh, at the primary location. Newly released unique products is called, this is called intertemporal price discrimination because it, it differs at different points in time or the product uh, life cycle. When a new product comes out, like the Segway, which was that people mover that one person could stand on and it had a motor and, and it had handles, and, and you could just go. It wasn't those horrible things that you fall off of all the time now that, that you guys have. But uh, it came out about probably 10 or 15 years ago. And initially, they were like $16,000 a piece. And they had chrome handles, and they had, they had leather handles and chrome wheels, and, and they looked phenomenal. But they were $16,000. Well, if you think about the different people who might want to buy this particular uh, item, Really highly trained executives in, uh, in, in major corporations have a very high time value. And many companies now have a campus where they have a, they have a manufacturing plant, they have a warehouse, they have the administrative offices all in one location. So prior to this thing becoming available, they would have a golf cart sitting in front of the administrative building, and they'd have a driver for it. And so if the CEO wants to go out to manufacturing, He'd call down, if the, if the thing's there, he'd go down, they'd drive him over, wait for him, bring him back, and so forth. Once this thing came out, I can buy three of these and put them downstairs, and then the CEO or the COO or the CFO, who have really high time value, can go down and, and just do it on their own. They don't have to wait for a driver. They don't have to wait for anything. They can just get on it and go. Plus, you could use it inside the buildings because it's very small as opposed to the golf cart. So the idea on intertemporal is you start out with a really high price and sell to those people who really value it a lot. And, and you don't announce you're going to come out with any of the models. And then 18 months later, they come out with a second model that was like $11,000. It didn't have leather, it had rubber, right? It didn't have chrome, it had painted wheels. So it, it didn't look as great. But the difference in price 
was much more than the difference in cost of production. It was clearly uh, price discrimination. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the Polaroid cameras, the same thing was true. When the, when the camera first came out, it was very expensive, like $800 at that time, which would put it in the thousands at this time. And, um, and it had chrome and a leather carrying case and all kinds of really nice stuff. 18 months later, they came out with a, with a, with a lower cost model. And eventually, they came out with a plastic camera that was only like $50, right? But again, you're moving down the, the demand curve in that uh, particular way. Freeway adjacent restaurants. If you have a restaurant next to the freeway, who are your potential customers? Travelers, travelers is one, but also those are travelers. Also what? Who else goes to restaurants? Locals, people who live there, good. So I have these two groups of buyers. The, the travelers want to come in off the freeway, get their meal, and go on, right? The locals may want to eat quickly, but they also may just be there to sit around and talk, right, and have, have fun. So who would be the inelastic demanders? The freeway people, right? Because they come in, they don't know anything about the area, so number one, they don't know about the substitutes, whereas the local people do. They know right around the corner there's a Marie Callender's or something. And, um, and so the locals have more knowledge of alternatives. They also can cook food at home as an alternative. They're the more elastic demanders. The freeway guys are the more inelastic demanders. I was, I was with a group. We were traveling up north. We stopped in Button Willow, and, or, or we stopped at that. There's a big restaurant. It's a beef restaurant. I can't remember the name. Somebody's ranch. Uh, and, um, and I was looking at the menu, and economists are always looking at stuff. They're always trying to figure stuff out. So I was looking at the menu, and they had meals like you see at McDonald's, right? They have, like, like this meal comes with a drink, fries, and, and the burger. Uh, and then this one comes with a sandwich and a salad and so forth. And they're bulk prices for them. Normally, if you buy the whole meal, what's true about the price relative to buying uh, a la carte? A la carte is when you buy each item. Normally, the group package is what? Cheaper. It's cheaper. It's cheaper because it's less costly for them because the, the, the uh, waitress can simply get a number. What do you want? Number seven. Okay. And then they can tell the cook, number seven, and he knows what it is. So it saves time on both sides, and that's, that's uh, uh, less costly. So there is a cost advantage. So I'm looking at the menu, and, and I'm, I'm comparing you know, the meals with, with a la carte, and it's cheaper to buy a la carte. So when the woman came, you know, all my friends said, I'll have number three and all of this. And I said, I want to order a hamburger, uh, and then I want to order fries. Uh, and I, I want to order a drink. And she said, well, then you want the meal. I said, no, I don't want the meal. I just want to have a burger and a drink and fries. Uh, who are the inelastic demanders? Travelers. Good. Travelers are not going to look at the a la carte prices because they know it's cheaper to buy the bulk. You all with me? Locals who go frequently will figure out what, what the pricing is. So again, you're raising the price, the inelastic demanders, lowering them to locals who are more elastic. You can also do, um, you can also mail out coupons by zip code, uh, and you can lower the price then to, to certain people. I had a, uh, a, a, an older guy uh, several years ago, he's like 35, and, um, and he took my class, he took 310, which is the advanced price theory, and, uh, and I talked about these these kinds of, uh, of projects. Well, he ran a, um, a, a carpet cleaning business in the valley. And I saw him six months later at some kind of a alumni function that this guy had come to. And I remembered him we when we were talking. And he said, oh, Professor Tots, I want to tell you, I, just, I loved your class. I really liked your class. Well, I knew he had gotten a C in the class. So I was surprised when he said he loved the class. And I said, well, why, what was it? He said, price discrimination. He said, I run this carpet business, and I service low-income groups in the valley, like Reseda and these, and I also service Tarzana and Sherman Oaks and Encino. So he painted the, he painted the vans, got them all painted up. 
He put his people in uniform so it looked much more professional. Then he sent out coupons to the, to the lower income groups and not to the people on the hill. So he was able to price discriminate and make more money. He didn't give me a check, which kind of upset me, but that's, that's okay. Mattresses will match any advertised price. You guys have seen these ads, right? The guy's screaming at you. We have the lowest prices in town. We'll, we'll guarantee to match any advertised price. In fact, if you can find a lower price for the same item, we will give you 10% of the difference. And that part, they kind of mumble at the end. So you think you're going to get 10% off, right? Well, no, it's 10% of the difference. So if the other guy's $10 more, then it's a dollar is what you're going to get off. Who gets the lower price? Only the people who come in with the ad, right? Good. They're, again, the more elastic demander because they're going out and getting information about the substitutes. The other guy who comes in who doesn't have it is the more inelastic demander. Also, as you all know, on mattresses, the mattress companies will sell to different distributors the same item, but it's called a different model. And it will have different, um, it'll have different color uh, on, on the outside of the mattress. That way, you can't, you can't find anybody else selling that exact model uh, uh, in, in competition. Uh, this is one of my all-time favorites. We went to a Chinese restaurant down in West LA on, uh, on, um, on a street. And, uh, and they have a lot of Chinese restaurants on there. It's just, it's on the west side of the freeway. I'll think about it when I'm driving home. Since Vietnam, I normally sit against the wall in a restaurant. But this time I was sitting at a table facing the back of the room. And we had about six people at the table. And uh, they passed out the menus, and we were looking at them, deciding what we wanted. And uh, and I looked at the back, and there was a there was a framed set of Chinese characters, uh, and uh, and and there were numbers on the left hand side. There were some numbers, and then Chinese characters and stuff. So I I thought it was a poem or something, right? Or you know, a famous saying or something like that. So I'm looking at that, and then I start looking at the menu. And it has the English name, and then it has the Chinese characters under it, right, to make it look uh, uh, good. So I'm looking at it, and then I'm looking at that. It's a menu. It's the same items, right, except the prices are lower, right? Ooh. Right. So the waitress came, and everybody, everybody else ordered, and she got to me, and I said, yeah, I'd like to have two of the second item and one of the fourth item. And she said, sir, you have to order from the menu. I said, I am. I'm ordering from the menu in the back. She said, sir, you have to order from the menu that I gave you. I said, let me see the manager. So the manager came out. I just congratulated them. I, it's just a beautiful form of price discrimination. If you're Chinese, you get the lower price, right? If you can read Chinese, you get the lower price. Stupid round eye Americans have to pay the higher price, right? Why would the Chinese people be, be, be more elastic demanders? Number one, they can cook it at home, right? Number two, they know all the, all the Chinese restaurants. They go to all of them. I was telling this story at USC, and one of my Chinese students came up uh, afterwards, and he said, uh, whenever I go out with my mother, she always asks for the Chinese menu. It's very seldom on the back wall. But there is usually a Chinese menu that's all in Chinese that has lower prices. So I thought it was one of the most clever, uh, clever examples. Yeah. No? No, you no. If if you if you can if you can figure it out, you know, I paid the full price. I didn't. I said I don't need the lower price. I, this is such a great example of price discrimination, and he didn't know what I, he thought I was saying. He was discriminating or something. So. <laughs> Good. So that concludes our discussion of monopoly pricing. Now let me.